Hey guys, welcome to Rebuilding the Beast. I'm your host, Bessel Zazili, NBA player turned podcast host. And on this show, I'm going to have a lot of my inspiring friends come on to share with you their rebuilding journeys. I hope you can take the tips from their lives and apply it to your life as well. Oh, and don't forget to hit subscribe, like, comment, share with a friend. Uh, yeah, all the things. All right, I'll see you guys soon. How you doing? I'm doing good. How's it? My name's Kama. Uh, Ka- everyone calls me Kama. Yeah, I've been trying to figure out how to say your name because say the whole name so I know how to say it. So Ziana? My whole name is Kama. Oh, that's my first name. Yeah, Ziana. Okay, Ziana. I'm but so still through the but whole I normally name. go by I normally go by Kamalani Dung. Kamalani Dung. So, yeah, but to make it easy, everyone just calls me Kama. Man, I'm so grateful that you um, you wanted to be on the show and tell your story. Looking into you or reading your your journey, you've had you've had quite the journey, huh? Yes, it, this has been a crazy ride for sure, and that's why that's why when I saw, I'm not too sure your page popped up on Instagram or something, and I I was kind of like reading into it. I was like, oh man, this person has all these amazing accolades, and then they also speak out for this podcast that's about like rebuilding the beast and I saw a little bit more of what you've been doing with it and I know anybody who's interested in telling stories along this lines have had has had their own story of their own like guaranteed I know that you've been through it (laughs) didn't even have to do any research just because you are trying to open up the platform for athletes and people in general to share their stories so that's why I was like ah like minds connect I was like sure I'm, I'm I'm gonna hop on (laughs) <laughs> no, thank you for that. Thank you for for being willing to share your story. So he, here's what I love about this. My biggest thing is that um, I think a lot of people need inspiration. And I've been through my own fair share of, um, you know, just just my, I have had my own story and trying to figure things out. So I've had to rebuild my life a lot of times. And through those rebuilds, I've learned am- amazing lessons. And I've been a better person because of them. So I want to share those lessons with people. But I just I don't want to just share my story. I want to share the stories of all the other people, amazing people like you, who have had incredible journeys. And maybe someone else who is kind of like you and trying to figure it out, whether it's softball and anything, it, like just anybody who's trying to be an athlete, a pro athlete. Maybe there's something you can tell them. There's, there's a tip they can take from your life that will give them inspiration to keep pushing a little bit more. The mantra That's for this so podcast awesome. is someday you will tell the story of what you went through. And that will be someone else's survival guide. Mm, I love that. So thank you. Welcome. So rebuilding the beast is, is threefold. Obviously, like, you know, I, I was the beast at one point. I've had to rebuild myself over and over. But also, there's three things about it. You are also the beast. And we have to go back and rebuild you and talk about who you are and how you became who you are. That's one. Two is the challenges that you've gone through and how you've had to face that. And those some people will say that is rebuilding, right? Sometimes you have to rebuild yourself to get through challenges. And then three is what are you evolving into? How are you transforming into the next beast? And so that's that's what this podcast is about. And um, I just want people to be inspired. That's that's really the, I don't have any. It's just this is just something that has been calling in my spirit for a long time. I just wanted people to have these beautiful stories, you know. Yeah, I love that. I love everything that stands for. And I think it, it's so important. So it's the amazing stuff that you're up to. OK, I only have one requirement, though, of this podcast. You got to be vulnerable. Oh, I'm down for that. Yeah, sounds yeah. good. Let's get into it. Let's, get uh, let's down do to it. Nitty gritty. All right. Kama, welcome to the Rebuilding the Beast podcast. You are an amazing human. Um, reading about you, model, actress, philanthropist, pitcher in softball, smallest pitcher, smallest pitcher in the pro leagues, also Hawaii's first ever pro softball pitcher, born and raised in Makaha, am I saying this properly? Makaha, Hawaii? Makaha, yep. Makaha, Makaha, Hawaii. Founded Kama Training, a Hawaii training program for youth and young adults with professional level skills, training, and lessons. D1 scholarship to Fresno State. I'm from Sacramento, so a little bit of connection there. 
D1 hey. Pac-12 full scholarship to Berkeley. I played in the Bay. Awesome. Gro uh, gold Love and it. bronze world medalist representing Puerto Rico. You are amazing. How you doing today? How's it? How's it, everybody? Aloha. I'm doing good. Oh man, what an intro. <laughs> this is your this is you. This is you, and you're just getting started. How old are you right now? Uh, I'm 25 years old. This is all your this is the resume, and this I'm sure there's a whole lot more as well, because we didn't talk about family and all the things that, you know, but this is your resume at 25 years old. Incredible. What do you hear? What do you feel when you hear people reading your resume? The things that you've accomplished? You know, I, I just honestly feel like at this point, I'm I'm just a vessel for all the hard work and all the people that have laid hands on me to get me to yeah. where I am today. Like hearing all the feedback of all the accolades that I have and having all these kids look up to me and whatever everybody may see on their end is like one thing. But from my perspective, you know, it's always it's always just the same thing. I'm just I'm just same old comma from my small town in Makaha, Hawaii. Um, and it's just, I, I come from such humble beginnings that it just, sometimes it doesn't even hit. It doesn't even hit like it's real, you know? Wow. I, I resonate with that very much. So, uh, let's go back. Let's, let's get into your story. Let's rebuild this beast. You were raised in Wainea. I, I'm going to butcher the name. So maybe to so help me out. <laughs> How do you say it? Wainai. Wainai. Why, Hawaii, okay. Yeah. Okay. You're raised in Wainai, <laughs> a place that you call the ghetto. and with all the idealized perceptions that we have about Hawaii, maybe you could tell us more about what it was like growing up there. Yeah, so a lot of people have this vision about what they think Hawaii is. They think it's just a paradise. Everyone wears their grass skirts. I mean, some people even up to now ask me if I live in a grass hut, if there's internet here, like, yes, we are fully functioning part of America. But um, a lot of people don't see kind of like the behind the scenes of what's going on. There's a ton of gentrification going on in Hawaii and kind of, you know, there's certain little towns where you're you're in the ghetto and, you know, times are hard. There's a huge, huge homeless problem here in the islands. Um, and then there's a ton of drug use. And, you know, it's one of the most expensive places to live in the world now because more and more people keep flooding on in because, you know, who doesn't want to live in Hawaii? It's paradise. But um, it's come to the point where I think the median house is like a million dollars. That's wow. kind of like, yeah, it's kind of average. So it's definitely pushing the natives and the local people to like these small corners where, you know, the whole system of just being trapped and getting getting into the wrong thing um, is kind of apparent. But yeah, my, my hometown where I grew up is Waianae, Hawaii. It's known as probably the most ghetto place on Oahu. Everybody knows, like, if you're from Waianae, you know, like, everyone's like, oh, you're a fighter. And it's like, mm. not always the perception, but um, <clears throat> it's definitely an interesting place because it's a one way in, one way out place. There's homeless people all over the place. And although the town is filled with amazing, just amazing good people, it's, it's also a place where there's a ton of poverty and it's kind of known of. Like if you come out of Waianae, it's like a huge thing that the community rallies behind because it, it's pretty much every odd stacked against you in order to get out of there from such a small town. And on, on the world scale of leaving the island, making an, an imprint on the world, it's just such a hard town to even get out of that, you know, when, when someone makes it, the whole town rallies around them. So I'm just super thankful that through my story, um, my parents have always just wanted such a better life for me. Uh, and we've been through our fair share of ups and downs. I mean, I've really went through it, whether it be having abuse in my life, whether it was going through divorce of parents, homelessness. Um, I was always the kid with the the shoes that had holes in it at practice. And I think it it's really a testament to my parents just pushing me like, this life isn't meant for you, you know, go out, go to a good school, leave the island, go to college, shoot for your big dreams, even though it may seem like you're, it's not meant for you, you know, because when you grow up in such a small town, it, it can be, it can be hard to envision such a big life. So I think my big thing is I'm thankful that I came from a small town. I went through these rock bottom moments that a ton of people may not have to go through. But now I understand that there are kids out there and I may have been lucky to have a coach that bought me the shoes that 
sent me in the right direction. So I think my goal now, um, after achieving so much, is to give back and find the next generation of, you know, little Kamalani's out there in these small rural towns or whether their situation is worse than mine, what, even if it's better than mine, you know, kind of just finding these athletes, finding these people that need just a push in the right direction that I got. And, you know, I got lucky with it being in the right place at the right time it just happened to work out for me and now I feel like I'm a vessel to find these kids and make it so that they don't have to get as lucky you know kind of make make a system and that's where my whole comma training is coming into play and I'm really just trying to change lives because I know sport changed my life I went from as you just heard small town girl in a very very bad area I could have went down such a different path Mm. to now I have this platform now I've been able to travel the world. I've been able to go to a top college free of charge. I would have never been able to pay for college first generation. So my whole life has been absolutely changed. And if I can just find one person or one child that can have their life changed in the same way, I think that's my my biggest thing right now, for sure. Everything about your story, I resonate with so much because I moved from Nigeria and with the help of my parents, they pushed me. They pushed me out of the box that I knew. And they told me to go dream, go be, go do the things. And with their support, I was able to come out here and it was hard. It was challenging. We're going to get into all that story with you as well. But let's talk about your parents. I read an article in the San Francisco Chronicle. And even like the first, one of the first paragraphs in there was a story where you noticed your parents were eating their burgers extra slow. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about this and maybe you just share the story? Yeah. So, I mean, my my story, I like to tell kind of like the vulnerable side that maybe not that many people like to tell because it's something that you kind of just skate over and you go through this adversity and then now you're you're winning now. So you don't need to think about those times. But I love to share my story because maybe if, if somebody's reading it who's in the same situation can get inspired, like ah, if she got out of it, so can I. Um, then that's that's where I love to just share that side of my life because I mean my my life has been some moments where it's been amazing, awesome. My parents had like this beautiful home. We had everything. We had a racetrack in our yard, and then there's also been times where it's like we're down to our last dollar. We're we have no dollars. We have one burger, and I I just remember some times where it's like. We've had nights of jumping from couch to couch on people, people's floors, people's living room floors. We've had nights in our cars. Um, And then there's been times where looking back, now I realize that it was hard. But in the moment, I mean, sharing a burger wasn't a big deal, you know, because we were all still having a good time. My parents were, um, now I look back and it's like, wow, yeah, like we were really all sharing a burger or my mom was eating that half of her burger slow to make sure that if I was still hungry, then she would give me her half. Um, But in the moment, it wasn't something that I realized as a child because it was kind of just normal. You know, if your parents give you like a a spam to eat for dinner or some ramen or, you know, um, a half of a burger, you're kind of just thankful that it's even there. And I mean, it's just noticing the small things that my parents would do where they would wait to see if I was still hungry. And if I was, then they would give me their half of the burger too. And if I wasn't, then they would eat it. So just the the um, huge amount of sacrifices that have gone into just everything that have led me here. It's really just not my journey. It's my family's journey as well. And just anyone who's ever even laid a hand on my on my journey and my life. And I think that's why I definitely feel like I owe a lot to to my family to everyone to the next generation because I really don't feel like any of this was on my doing of course Mm -hmm. I had to put in the hard work and you know I was the one that had to show up to practice I was the one that would stay extra long at the field but it all started with the small sacrifices that I saw my parents make and my family make and that kind of just translated into where I am today what was the hardest part about growing up for and what would you, mm. what kind of advice would you give to kids who are facing poverty right now? Mm, that is awesome. That's such an awesome question. Nobody's even asked that yet. And I've been on a on a podcast. Um, I think the hardest part about growing up poor would be 
just feeling helpless you know like i've i've had genuine times where i've searched on my laptop do you know how low in a point you have to be to go on google and search i need help can someone help me help near me you know like what kind of low point you have to be in to just like resort to something like that and mm. i searched i searched for can someone like free laptops near me free shoes near me and it's just it was those are the type of like gut wrenching moments for me where it's like sheesh i think god i made it out of there but it's just i i know the feeling of mm. gosh can someone anyone please help me help us help my family can somebody help me and in those times it it's not always promised that somebody's going to come and help so sometimes you kind of just got to grind it out and figure out a way but for me what i've realized is kind of just leaning into the cards that you're dealt and not focusing on the hand that you're not dealt so wow. if you don't if you don't have new shoes if you don't have a laptop you're just going to have to find a way. If you don't have a car, it it comes down to like what your why is and thankfully I had a community of my parents or my mom where she was just like hammering in it, hammering it into me of just pushing me like you're going to figure out a way. You're always going to figure out a way. We always find out a way. So I think that if if you guys are listening or if people are listening and you don't have that community to tell you like everything's going to work out, you're going to find a way. I think that's where I would love to just be that person right now that tells you like I've been there and I can tell you wholeheartedly if I can get out of it you can get out of it too it's going to it's not always going to be easy but the key is to look at everything that you're dealt and just run with that so I may not have had my laptop to apply for scholarships I may not have had the the correct shoes to wear to to play my game to the top of my ability I may not have had the funds to to you know help my family or whatever it may be that I wanted to do at the time I may not have had a car to get to where I needed to go but in those situations you figure out a way mm-hmm. you ask your friends for a ride you you be a good person and you attract people who want to help you 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 go to the library and find an extra laptop that um the library allows you to to use for a little bit and you really just make do with what you have and i think that if you go ahead and set your goals to what you want to achieve in this life whether it's playing pro whether it's going to college whether it's just making a better life for yourself in general i think set set that goal and then just move into it full force with what you have and you know growing up as a poor kid i think the number one thing is you're going to have to get creative you're going to have to have some creative ideas of hmm how am i going to get to my practice today who could potentially help me throw the ball around today because i may not have a, a father figure or a mother figure there that can help mm-hmm. me um you know so i think i think for for anyone listening that's been in those situations like i feel you it's not always going to be easy but i can 100% guarantee you that you'll get out of it i can guarantee it, yeah yep just that you know like end of the day you'll get you'll get through it so i think that that's just an important of uh, important thing you'll get through it just get creative you have such an amazing spirit to you and the way that you speak i just i can feel it in you when you speak and so thank you for for the heart that you're giving all of us cuz even me i'm like i'm mesmerized with your storytelling um mm-hmm. just like you and we have this in common as well where sports came and ch- just turned my life around uh, mm-hmm. tell me about your introduction to softball Excuse me. Tell me about your introduction to softball and how that how that whole journey began for you. Were you natural when you started playing softball? Uh, so I actually started out playing baseball. I played mm. t-ball and I started at a young age. I think I was maybe five or six and I was terrible. Is that I, big in Hawaii? Chase... T-ball? Yeah. Or and baseball? Yeah, it's pretty big. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, we got some we got some baseball players coming out of here. So um it was pretty much more of a an activity for my parents like i was on the best team all the parents would just like have such a great time and it would just be all the kids were amazing and then i'm pretty sure we were just on the team because my parents were friends with everyone and they were like uh i mean i guess we'll let her on you know <laughs> like, so 
So I, I was terrible. I would chase butterflies in the outfield, run the bases the wrong way. Like everyone's just like, why is this kid here? <laughs> like, wow. But but then I went on um to tell my parents, I'm like, man, this sucks. I'm not good at this. So they were like, you know what? Try softball. And my my papa on my mom's side was huge into baseball. He was played on a team called the Ricans, which stood for like Puerto Ricans and everything. So it's such a crazy full circle now that I'm looking back. But I we we kind of got into it because of him. So they put me into softball. And then one day um, they were asking if anybody wanted to pitch and raise my hand. Everyone kind of knew that I stuck at T-ball. So they're like, let's just ignore that kid a little bit. But like nobody else could do it. So they were like, OK, fine, we'll give you a chance. So I went up there and I struck out the first three batters as like this little kid. And in that moment, everyone's like, whoa, wait a minute. Wow. I think we're on to something. So from that moment on, it was me just being inspired. Like I would love going to the park and watching the older girls pitch. Everywhere I would walk, I would just do the pitching motion. And looking back, it's kind of interesting that my family even let me do that. Like I would just do it in the stores. I would do it everywhere I went. My arm circle just through the aisles and um and once I started to get really good my parents started to have like kind of a passion behind it and it was mm. never for any reason but just to play and just because of that winning mentality of like being the best at whatever you go into so my parents would just like my dad would lock me outside of the house and tell me to keep pitching until I was good enough to like hit all the spots so I would just be hammering at the wall and I'd be like can I come and tease about there and we'd be like nope I was like Awesome. <laughs> yeah, Can pops. I have some water? <laughs> what is, well, like, what was, did you enjoy that part? Did you enjoy practice or were you like Alan Iverson? Practice? Hey, I think it was a mixture of me enjoying it. And at the same time, there's days where I'm like, come on, can I just get a water? And like, he'd be like, there's a hose outside. I was like, that's a shit. Uh, <laughs> so it's like a nice little mix of like my passion mixed with, hmm. You know, that one parent that just unnecessarily pushes you. I feel like all of us pro athletes can relate in one way or another. There was someone in our lives that was just a little extra at pushing us. So, for sure. Um, I, had, yeah. I had a guy in my life for sure that pushed me and he didn't let me quit. And I had so many times in my life where I almost yeah. quit. So when you talked earlier about having <clears> luck, <throat> that's where my luck came in. Because what I could control is just being a good kid. But what he did mm -hmm. for me, because he saw that in me, he was like, okay, well, like you have this potential. And I won't let you quit. And I'll make sure that you continue to. He was like a father figure for me because I moved here without my family to the United States. So what was what do you think? Where do you think your life would be without softball? Mm, that is a crazy good question. I mean, I have some friends that had the talent and didn't go go on to play because they may not have had that, that luck or that person that we that we had to guide us and make us continue on. and they i mean i wouldn't say that their lives are bad but i'd say that it's you know maybe they may have went down a wrong path here or there some of them have kids and families and kind of a lot of regrets a lot of people will come up to me and say like man i wish i i went to school i wish i kept playing softball you know so i'm not really sure where my life would have ended up but i i'm sh i'm sure i wouldn't have went to college i wouldn't have traveled the world i wouldn't be speaking here today that's for sure mm. um so i'm not sure where i would have been may have went down a wrong path with you know just the community that i was in back home so just thankful for for the sport for sure you are hawaii's first pro softball pitcher that's huge by the way what's your advice for anyone striving to become a pro athlete especially women mm. Yeah, that's a good question. I never actually wanted to be a pro athlete. I It was never something that was a dream of mine because it kind of didn't exist until recently. And now there's more of like a presence, a TV presence for it. But um, I think that if, if anyone's looking for advice on being a pro athlete, I think the key is to kind of just, like I said, go with the hands that you're dealt and just don't ever quit and just keep growing and not put a limit on yourself because for me out the gate I was going to Fresno State on a full ride because I was a late recruit I didn't really understand recruiting because I was from Hawaii and I'm kind of one of the trailblazers 
in the community of like what it looks like to get recruited and what the process is. Wow. So went to Fresno State and it's just the gratitude at every level that you're at. So I wasn't ever like, oh man, wish I went to play in the Pac-12, wish I went to Cal. Like the whole time I was like, yes, this is where I got to be, Fresno State. They're paying for my school. This is the perfect, perfect fit for my situation. So I'd say look for your perfect fit for your situation. And then from there, if you put in your max effort, then your next perfect fit is going to come. So then that's when Cal came. Then they gave me a full ride. And then from there, it's kind of just, you know, with the hands that you're dealt, if you go all in, life will present the next opportunity for you. So if you if you strive to be the best at every level, you're going to keep rising. And I think that one big thing for me was li- limiting beliefs. You know, coming from a small town, it can be hard to just imagine getting to that big level, especially if it's something nobody's ever done before. So why would I be the first pro pitcher? No one's ever done that before. You know, these are the type of thoughts that are are very limiting. And I have a story of um, when I was going to a national team tryout, uh, or I was invited to the national team tryout when I was in high school. And this is just something that has been so apparent in my whole life. Mm. And I threw a kicking and screaming fit. I was like, I do not want to go. Like, I'm not really? good enough. Why? Uh-huh. Yeah, I was like, I was like, why would I go like all the way out to Florida just to get cut? And my mom was like, no, we're going. I'm buying your ticket today. And I literally like made it a point. I was like, I am not going to go out there to look silly and get cut. I am not going. So we didn't end up going because I was so sure that I was going to get cut and I didn't want to go. And then found out a little while later, of course, they had the tryout. The team was made. I didn't go. So I didn't make it. And I found out later that the coach was waiting for me to show up and I already had a spot. So it was one of those big, big moments for me where What'd you learn? my limiting belief. Yeah, my limiting belief took the best of me in that situation. And what I learned from that moment on is that sometimes you just got to show up. You know, if the opportunity is presented to you, if the opportunity is there in front of you, like, life and God does not present you an opportunity that you are not ready for. Like you wouldn't have the opportunity if you weren't ready for it. And then you, so first of all, you got to shoot the shot too. Like you yes. miss a hundred percent of the shots that you don't take. Thank so you, you didn't show yes. up. So God was like, okay, well, I'm just going to put this gift back right here. Exactly. So, you know, sometimes we can be our own worst, you know, enemy and block our own blessings. And I think that in terms of, going to the next level and whatever it may be, sport, business, life, anything, sometimes you just you just got to show up and you may have a spot already waiting for you, but you'll never know if you don't actually go. So that was one thing, one moment for me that I've taken through my whole life. And e- ever since that moment, every time an opportunity is presented and I want to kick and scream and yell, I'm not going to look silly. I'm not going to look good going out there getting cut. Like... <laughs> Then I'll think of that moment like, but yeah, that one time you didn't go and you didn't even need to try out. You could have probably just walked over there and you would have got the spot. So, and so what if you look silly? That's a huge one for me. That's another part. That's like another part too is like also like, so what if you did fail? Or what what if you did, like how else do you know? Because at the end of the day, like how do you know how much you've put it? Like how do you know the most you can do if you don't get to mm-hmm. a limit? And the limit is usually failure, right? Like if you don't, yeah. if you get to the to the trials and you see all these different people okay i'll give you an example i remember like i played with steph curry right and i remember like steph was always he's always been good since i've known him right because he came from college and all the things but i think there was a point where he goes to the usa he goes play with the usa team and i think that was where he realized yo i'm i'm the guy you know what I mean? Especially when you're around the other people who are also doing the same thing. I think sometimes you need to get to that point where you're comparing your, which is, you know, we always say don't compare yourself. But yeah, this is the point where you get to compete against other people who are the best and you get to see yourself and measure yourself. If you're not up to the mm-hmm. task, then you understand that you have to work harder to get there. Yeah. But you don't know that until totally. you put yourself in that in that situation. You know what I mean? Yeah, that, that's good. Yep. So I, I feel that. I think if you if you go all in and strive to be the best at whatever hand you're dealt and you show up to your opportunities, you'll get to wherever you're trying to go for sure. Mm. 
female athletes are often overlooked more they 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 face more criticism than their male counterparts what is for you personally the biggest frustration or struggle being a female pro athlete hmm. being a female pro athlete is something that is still being worked out so hmm. i think a lot of people give criticism because they think that female athletes are always like expecting the same as our male counterparts but in my personal opinion i mean somebody had to be the first nba player somebody had to be the first mlb player and those guys definitely got they didn't come out the gate with a million dollar contract they didn't come out the gate with all these fancy lights and and sparkles you know so it's it's I feel like right now as a female pro athlete we're kind of in the building stage of setting the foundation. I mean, now we're on TV, softball is one of the biggest growing sports in the nation that's being watched. It's something where if you watch it you're interested. It's a really fast-paced game. There's a lot of action, um a ton of, you know, sliding into each other and just home runs. So it's like a really fast-paced like exciting game and it's something that people are falling in love with, but I think that a lot of people think that we expect like oh why didn't i get my million dollar contract i'm a pro athlete but it's like you know i kind of understand that we're starting to get the ratings we're starting to lay the foundation so for me i i know my role as somebody who's paving the way that probably in the next 5 10 years maybe they'll get their big contract and then i'm going to have to shoot them an email and be like hey man i really laid the foundation for you would love if you could like wire me over some of that extra <laughs> but like <laughs> The older guys, the play, the guys who played the NBA a long time ago, they watched the contracts being signed now and they're like, "Oh my gosh," you know, because they always tell these stories of what they had to go through. I sat next to one of these guys when it's uh Jim Barnett who played with the Warriors a long time ago. And he was telling the story about, you know, staying in separate hotels from the black players and do all these different things and you know, flying commercial all the place and you know, having to deal, you know, it was It was it was a whole lot different. It was a whole lot different time, especially he's flying in the era where it would smoke on the planes, you're an athlete, you're, you know, all these different things. So, um yeah. Them paving the way. And maybe let's go back a little bit because we got to go back to your college experience because that's also another interesting part. So, you get to college. You get to Fresno State. What is what is this new journey like for you? What is it like coming from Hawaii? Are you accepted? Are you do you feel like this is a this is a new fresh new start and I'm I'm loving this what is that experience Yeah it's for sure different I mean in Hawaii we have a huge culture here of you know family everything family oriented you can pick up a random stranger off the street kind of invite them into your house make sure they're all good before you send them back on their way so that was a huge difference when I got up there I mean going up to California and seeing kind of this doggy dog mentality to a certain extent at Fresno and of course getting worse once I went to the Bay Area by San Francisco but mm-hmm. um yeah it was a huge culture shock for me I mean I would go to like give people like a honey which is like a kiss on the cheek that we all do in Hawaii everyone does that to each other and then people like suck out their hand for the handshake and I was just like oh like nice. uh-huh. I, was like, I was like stuck so It was a huge culture shock and there was definitely times where I wanted to give up and come home because it it was just too hard or too different for me but I'm I'm glad that I stuck it out and that my family kind of just they were like we knew it was going to be different they were like girl like get it together go out there and dominate and do what you always do and you'll be fine so Fresno State was awesome just going through that experience Fresno is a huge sports school so everywhere i went it was just like hey Fresno state pitcher at the stores had all the different restaurants so everybody recognized me and i even came back as a cow coach 3 years later my fifth mm-hmm. year at cow i did um assistant coaching and i was decked out in all cow gear and i was at the gas station and the clerk was like Fresno state pitcher and i was like wow What? and they were like you pitched at Fresno, right? And I was like, "Hey, I did." I was like, "What? How did you recognize me? I'm in all cow gear. I look a little different. Like my hair is a different color." They're like, "We remember. We remember our people." So wow. I was like, "Dang. Amazing experience." So, yeah, I think that 
my Fresno State experience was a mixture of me like having to get adjusted in the beginning, but then just so amazing after that. You, um, I mean, you were killing it, right? Your first year, second year, I think you're the one of the best pitchers on the team, but you were the best pitcher on the team. And then you decide that you want to transfer. You get a, a scholarship offer from, from UC Berkeley. Were they a better softball team? So um, the transfer came from my coach leaving. So my coach left, and then I was kind of reevaluating my situation of if I wanted to continue playing at Fresno State or if I wanted to kind of look at my options. And I got lucky because the, the Mountain West pitcher before me, Mountain West pitcher of the year before me went over to University of Arizona. They ended up winning the Pac-12 championship and doing amazing under her. So me as the next reigning Mountain West pitcher who was coming out and transferring, it was like the it was like Hawks. Like I pretty much had my pick of every college in the nation because everyone was like the last Mountain West pitcher was proven to do it really well at the next level of like where they went. So everyone was like ready. Like any school that had a full ride available was pretty much like we want you, we're ready. Just let us know, kind of thing. But it was like a crazy chaotic time for me. I was crying about leaving friends. I was crying about where I was going to pick next. So although I had all these amazing opportunities for me, it was just like, oh my goodness, such a such a hard, hard time deciding to leave a place that really took a chance on this small town Hawaii girl and then like where to call my new home. Um, and it was, I was a late transfer. So it was like, I needed to make a decision ASAP. Um, but then I ended up deciding on Berkeley because of the academics. So I picked Fresno because it was a softball school. I decided to kind of switch up my game plan and pick somewhere due to the academics. And then they're also in the Pac-12. So every day I would be playing against the Washingtons, Arizonas, Oregon. So I knew that I'd be playing against the top competition. Mm -hmm. And Cal has always been known as one of the top softball schools. So it was it was a pretty, pretty easy decision for me there. To, to transfer. When you end up going to a new school and you get there, is it starting over? Does this feel the same? Does this feel better? What, what did that feel like to, to have a whole new team again? And like almost you're a junior, but you're also starting over trying to prove yourself again. Yeah, it's, inter it's an interesting vibe because everyone's kind of a little like questionable, like, oh, who's this person? What are they like? And I mean, for me, I was coming in as, someone that everyone was expecting to really just step in and just, just go go for it you know because I was coming in as a Mountain West pitcher of the year I had pretty good stats and accolades coming in so everyone was like oh yeah Kama's gonna come in and she's gonna do work immediately so I already had that reputation and kind of that expectation which was is that good, good is that bad. pressure yeah I was about to say it's good which is good and bad because you know it, it's it's good because I was expected I was I didn't have to fight as hard for my spot, but at the same time, I had so much to prove. So it, it felt, it was like a good, a good mix of good pressure and bad pressure, if that makes sense. No, that makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense. Is there a point during your career that you realize, I want to do this professionally? I'm going to go yeah, far. I think, yeah, I think it was during my senior year where I started to realize that sports wasn't going to last forever and that I was kind of starting to look for new ways of like how can I continue to play like you know you put in all this effort all these years I played since the age of five and then a ton of people get to the end of their college years and it's just that's it mm -hmm. you know sports sports is one of those crazy things where it's like it's inevitable that one day it's going to end for everyone it's not like music where you can continue to keep singing your whole life it's not like some trade that you've built out from a young age as a, like a computer scientist where you just keep getting better and better and you go to the end of your years like sport is one thing that it doesn't matter who you are it doesn't matter if you're a park legend it doesn't matter that if you're a pro athlete it doesn't matter if you're one of the legends like tom brady like one day you're gonna have to stop and it, it's such a hard pill to swallow for athletes in general because it's like like you said you build this beast and then you get to this wall where it's like, boom, you know, like a lot of people coming out of college are just like, OK, now I'm, well, now I'm a, an accountant, like, you know, like something like that. So it's like <laughs> this is crazy feeling of like, I think 
also that's one thing I've been trying to help athletes with is like kind of just making sure that you continue everything that you've learned through your sport onto your next beast that you build. So mm. you build up this athlete that's just amazing. And for me, I got to this point where I was like, I don't want to, you know, just forget everything that I've learned and be some sort of like businesswoman or like learn this new trade. It's like, bro, I want to keep going. I want to use everything that I've learned to to the next stage of my life. So I think that's that's been a big, a big challenge as well for a lot of athletes. I think that we don't fully understand our powers. Athletes don't, because as athletes, we the the sport is actually a, is a game of life, right? Like there's so many metaphors about our lives that you can see in sports. Whether it's leadership, teamwork, it's the ability to persevere, the ability to bounce back from from losses and from bad games and for challenges. The it, it, there's, I mean, it, the list goes on and on. How do you handle wins? How do you handle losses? What is it like to work with a coach, be coached, and then to be a coach to your teammates that are younger? There's there's so much that you learn as an athlete. So there's a reason why people want to, they choose a lot. There's some companies that feel like if you're a student athlete, that actually is a boost in your resume. A lot of companies feel that way, right? Because of the things that come, these innate lessons that we learn just playing the sport. So for you, um, before you became pro and, and when you did become pro, what what was the things that what drew you to, the, to, to wanting to play pro? Why did you want to play pro? Did you, is there something that you wanted to prove? Did you really love the sport that much that you didn't want to stop? What, what is it about playing professionally? Because for me, playing pro was like, I want to be one of the best. I had something to prove. Like I, I came from a place where I wasn't any good. People told me I was terrible. And that always resonated with me. So I just always had something to prove. What was your thing that, that, that pushed you? Yes, I I can 100% agree where it's like coming from a small town, you don't got much. So for me, yes, it was I had something to prove of just all the people who have doubted you throughout every single level. Oh, she can't play varsity in high school. Oh, okay, she did it. Well, she can't, she can't play D1. Ah, she can't play Pac-12. Ah, she wouldn't be able to play national team. And then now it's like people are like, ah, but she would never play pro. And it's just like this one thing of me just always being like, yeah, whatever, yeah, whatever, yeah, whatever. (laughs) So that's why I initially went and played pro ball. And then after my first year of pro, after I proved that I already could do it, I came to this weird mindset of like, now what? You know, like I I wanted to play because I wanted to prove something. And then now I played and proved it. So what now? So I took a year off from the sport, actually. And I wanted to I'm, I'm that type of person where I like to push my limits and prove things in different categories. So I had a lot of people coming out of Berkeley that were a little toxic saying like why don't you get a real job this and that blah 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 and I mean the real jobs they were talking about paid less than me playing pro so I was just like first of all you don't know anything that you guys are talking about but second of all I'm gonna do it just to prove you guys wrong Mm, just for fun love it so so I ended up going and I worked for a company called open sponsorship in New York and they're the world's number one leading software for connecting brands and athlete so it was such a yeah it was a role that a lot of people said I wasn't qualified for they're like who do you think you are going in stepping in as this kind of role but I knew in my heart I was like I'm a marketing expert I'm an athlete I've done deals before I was like I'm a high performer if somebody's there that's better than me I'm gonna just work to get to their level like it's simple as that I knew that I was gonna succeed no matter what because I was willing to put in the extra work so I wasn't afraid applied went through a pretty tough interview process because they were like girl you just came out of college what what experience do you have and I was like let me show you so it was one of those like (laughs) crazy situations where you just walk in the office and say like give me the job let me let me prove to you that I can do it and I went in and within the first year I went from entry level to one of the senior account executives doing six-figure deals for brands like Walmart HelloFresh like these huge companies and on the phone with these CMOs, CEOs, and just making these deals and giving them to teams like the Chiefs and all these different people. And like at one point talking to Logan Paul and his manager about the six figure deal. So it was a huge learning, awesome experience for me. But it was also something where I was like, me, a small town girl from Bakaha, Hawaii, playing pro, going out and becoming one of the top in in the whole company for doing these deals. I'm like, it's not because of anything other than the fact that 
I put in ultimate effort. Mm. And this is something that anybody can do. So it was like approving to me and approving to all the future generations and just anyone I talked to where it's like, if you want to go play pro, I did, you can too. You know, you just gotta, you just gotta be able to do what other people aren't willing to do. And it was another thing to go corporate where I'm just like, any athlete is so capable of being the best in their building. It's you just gotta believe in yourself kind of thing. So did that, proved it, and then it came to the point where I came back this second year to play pro again. And this time it was different because it was pushed by my family. So my family saw me doing all these things and I was in Hawaii. I was kind of rolling, living my best life over here, just like beautiful beaches, can't complain. And my brother comes up to me and he's like, you got a pro offer, huh? Again, another year. And I was like, yeah. And I'm like, yeah, but I think I'm going to hang them up. Like I haven't pitched in a year. Uh, you know, yeah, it's getting to that point where I don't know if I want to play anymore. And he was like, do you remember me sleeping on the concrete at all of your games? Do you remember mom and dad sacrificing all of these things for you? Do you remember all of your teammates who wish and pray that they would have gotten a scholarship and an offer to play pro? He's like, and you have this offer that so many, the 99% of the world, 99% of your world mm. would have killed for and helped you get there. And you're going to turn it down. He was like, that's selfish to me. And I was like, okay, oh. first of all, you're not the one out there pitching. But I, but I did take a step back and I was like, dang. That's back. It's like the 99% of the people in my life have sacrificed so much for me to get to where I am. And so many people were all of my old teammates would have killed for the opportunity. And here I am with all these opportunities. And I'm just like, nah, I did it. I'm, I'm done. I don't care. And I was like, that is so selfish of me. So he was like, one day you're not going to, you're not going to have the paper and the opportunity to go play and it's not going to be up to you to decide it's going to be up to everyone else and they're going to be like you know Kama's just not there to play anymore he's like do you want to leave on your terms or you know or, or theirs so I was like you know what I'm going to do this for my family so the next this past year when I started playing pro again was I, I made a hashtag for the 99 percent mm, I and saw that yes my that that's kind of the backstory behind it of for the 99 because I I wasn't playing to prove something for myself. I wasn't prove, playing because, you know, of the, my passion for the game. I was playing for the 99% of people who mm. don't don't get their big break for whatever opportunity it is. So I was playing for them and playing and standing up for them and representing them because now that I've made it to the 1%, you know, like I just want to represent the 99. So that was my whole thing this whole past year and like throughout the rest of my time playing pro um i might hang it up next year after next year we got a few big tournaments with the puerto rican national team but yeah right now it's just a big thing for me of like representing everyone that helped me to get to where i am representing everyone that may have missed their opportunity and you know representing that 99 and a lot of people have resonated with that one you know through your through our career right and one of the things i reason one of the things that I'm hearing a lot in your voice is, is just the self-belief and you stay positive through the things and you always realize you always try to find a way to, to make things work. Sometimes in life, life just smacks you and you just don't know where it's coming from. Before your career took off, your, your mom was dealing with the aftermath of a stroke. Mm -hmm. In that period, in that time, how did you stay positive? How did you keep a smile on your face? How did you keep going in your career? I think it's super important to have have a why and that that's the, the power that will drive you through the tough times so for me my mom had a stroke my sophomore year of college and it was really bad I mean I got a phone call in the middle of the night and my brother was calling and I I was about to not answer but he doesn't call often so I kind of second guess I was like you know what I'm gonna answer and see what's up call answer the phone call and he said mom had a stroke and she's not gonna make it mm. So it was one of those gut wrenching moments where I like, dropped to my knees. Just here, the, my world was going crazy. And I was all the way in Fresno and she was in Hawaii. So I, I've always been raised as a really tough kid. Um, so the next day, I didn't tell anyone except for my roommates. And then my coach comes up to me and says, Kama, do you have something to tell me? And I was like, no. And she was like, well, your teammates told me that your mom had a stroke. 
I bought you a flight. You're going home. So my coach was one of those people that just, you know, this is why it's so important to surround yourself with a good tribe, pick good people in your life. Cause like a mom, she bought me my flight home cause I wouldn't have been able to afford it. And I got to fly home and see my mom. And it was just, I remember the whole plane ride there, just thinking like she could have went at any moment. So it was just like a really numb, chaotic feeling of like nothing mattered in the world of just like, I didn't know what was going on. Mm. And it was a huge slap in the face moment. And I get home and she's partially paralyzed and in really bad shape. And after a week or so, she starts to be able to like speak again and everything is like starting to calm down. So she had like bleeding in her brain and it was it was a huge thing. And we all thought she was going to go. And then she finally like she's such a strong woman. So she just had the strength to just stand firm. And she leans over to me once everything kind of stabilizes out. And she's like, do you remember like all the effort that we put in? And I was like, yeah. And she's like, I can't have you giving it all up to stay home to make sure that I'm okay. She's like, I'm going to be okay. I, won't, I need you to make sure that you're okay and to make sure that your brother and your sister are going to be okay. You need to go back. So from her hospital bed, partially paralyzed on her left side, booked me my flight back to Fresno. And I'm just like, what is going on? I was like, geez, what a strong woman, strong mom, you know, like that. Mm -hmm. If anything, if anyone deserves a movie, it's my mom, like a testament to her true character throughout all of these, these huge crazy moments where she sends me back to college because she knew if I stayed longer I probably would have like dropped out went back to try to find college here in Hawaii you know just my life would have changed so she sends me back up and throughout that whole time it, it was just my why that kept me going because how can I focus my mom's at home just bedridden yeah. like could go at any moment it was it was really just like my why was what she told me which was we all work to get you this better life so that we all can have a better life. You have to keep going. So that's pretty much what just kept me going through through tough times is your why. And everybody's going to have to figure out what their why is. And I think that's the number one thing that can keep us going. I think it's a Nietzsche quote that says, he who has a strong enough why can endure anyhow. And the idea is if, you're, if your reason is strong enough, you can get through anything. Yeah. Um, we, uh, well, actually now I want to quote you. Okay. You said, even though I've been through the rock bottom, I've learned that it's nothing to be ashamed of. It's not, there's nothing to be ashamed about. It's something to build off of. I love that by the way. Um, we've spoken about shame in, in several other episodes because it's such a deciding factor, whether you're able to be at peace and happy, how do you manage to not care about other people's opinions. I think other people's opinions are a projection of their limiting beliefs. So for me, I think that people will project onto you what they think that they can't do or what they're insecure about. So if if someone's judging you on something, it's because they're lacking that in their lives. Mm. So for me, it's it's really not about me. I think that if someone's judging me about something, that's their lack and that's their opinion. But I know, I know my truth. And for me, I just keep elevating and I have my eyes on the prize, which is wherever my next move is and whatever my why is and whatever my goals are and whatever people's opinions are about me. That's their own thing. Cause I've seen time and time again, people will say I'm not good enough. People will say I can't do it. People will judge me and my family for whatever experiences I've been through. And then you, you touch back with them in five years because I kept my head on my road and I kept moving forward and they kept their eyes on me and stayed the same. Mm. And everybody's always, Ooh. always like, yep. Everyone's always like, Oh, can we have a picture? Oh, can you help me with this? Oh my gosh. Such a great girl. I love her. This, that it's happened hundred percent of the time. So for me, I know that if you keep pressing forward and doing good, following your why, attacking your goals, anybody who's talking bad about you, just just give them love and you look back in five years they'll be your biggest fans every time 100 percent of the time no fail wow you're so wise um <laughs> <laughs> just like i was i was listing all the things that you've done i'm gonna keep listening more okay so you're 
model actress, you founded Karma Training. All this is all impressive. How do you juggle all of this? And, and then what is your next big goal? I think that for me, I, I keep everything really light. And yeah, for me, it's like, I don't, you know, you kind of just, you just roll with the punches of trying to balance all these things and whatever flows, flows, whatever doesn't work out, doesn't work out. And for me, a huge thing was I was feeling a ton of pressure because I had all these different categories, all these people texting me, emailing me, just trying to keep up with so many different avenues of business because they're not the same. It's not all like all sports. I can focus. It's like sports, marketing, business, whatever, content creation, modeling. Mm -hmm. So it's just like, oh my goodness, there's a lot going on. And I was feeling the pressures at one point, but for me, I really just gave it up to, to God. This past year, I got back into church and super, super close to, to God and putting my, my worries on top of his word and kind of just giving it up to like, whatever's going to happen is going to mm. happen has been a huge thing for me. And it's taken the load off completely because it's, it's just shown me that there's no pressure to do any of these things. And through my strength, I may not be able to do it, but through the strength of believing in this high, higher power of God helping me, I know that with his supernatural strength, it's going to find a way to work out. So that's been a huge, yeah, that's been a huge thing for me. It's, so yeah, that's, that's probably my secret to it is just, giving it up, keeping it light. I, I, I love to joke around about stuff. Like, obviously I can be super serious and business-like, but for me, I think that life is meant to be fun and we're meant to, you know, shoot, mm -hmm. shoot for our goals and our Absolutely. dreams and surround ourselves with good people. So that's where I think, um, just keep it light. And if it works out, it works out. If it doesn't, it doesn't, but if you give you a hundred percent effort, like it's a, it's a journey and there's always going to be different seasons. So right now my season is giving up all these things and seeing whatever role, whatever happens. We can't leave here without you talking about karma training and what that is. It's a pipeline for youth to play softball in Hawaii. So can you just talk a little bit about that and, and what that means for you? Yeah. Yeah. So for me, I have these huge goals. I have this foundation that I've made and this thing that's called comma training and it's where i provide athletes of the pacific with resources that i may have needed growing up so for me mm -hmm. i i provide them with help in coaching to get their skills up to a higher level i support them in life um and kind of just just guiding them through the process of whatever it is that they want to use sports as a vessel for with with a really big emphasis on athletes who are underserved or underprivileged so my big thing is finding the next generation of commas that may not have the shoes like i said in the beginning may not have the funds may not have the family support and giving them a place that when they search up i need help or free laptop near me my thing pops up now instead of nothing so it's just a huge wow. moment, you know it's a huge moving moment of my goal is to start with softball and then serve all athletes because we're inclusive of the pacific and then maybe even bigger eventually but just starting off with like i know that that moment that i've had where you feel helpless and in those moments, I want those athletes to search on Google and find me instead now. Free laptops near me, and then they see your face, and they see your, your thing and your program. That's a, an amazing full circle moment. So in the spirit of full circle, my final question is always the same. What would you say to your younger self, the comma that was sleeping, in the car, um, the one that was sharing burgers with her parents, um, the person that didn't believe in herself going into the national tournament. What would you say to her now? Hmm. I think I'd say to just keep going and trust the process because my journey and all of those things that I've been through were all for a purpose. 
So it may seem like a struggle now, but every single thing that we're all going through always equates to something in the future. And I've been told this over and over again, which is when you're given a kuleana, which is the Hawaiian word for a responsibility, then it unlocks your mana. And mana is the Hawaiian word for power. So when you're given your responsibility, then it unlocks your power. And that's something that I've realized recently because I could have either been someone to dwell on the past and kind of just been selfish of okay maybe I'll just stay at my New York job do my thing be selfish and you know never help another person in my life or I could pick on the kuleana of having these experiences realizing what these kids are going through and then it unlocks my power of you know what maybe I'll take a stand maybe I'll speak out maybe I'll build something instead of just letting it be where the next comma is searching online free laptops near me and nothing still pops up. Uh-huh. So when you when when someone tells you what your kuleana is or we realize what that is, it will truly unlock our power and our mana of what what we're capable of doing. And I think that I would tell my younger self, all of this is you learning what your kuleana is. And it's all gonna pay off. The goal is to keep going, keep showing up to your opportunities. And in the future you're gonna affect more lives with your mana and your power than you even can understand. So trust the process, keep going. All of this is showing you exactly where you're supposed to be. And wow, mm-hmm. you are a rock star. And I was I'm gonna <laughs> say, I want to say rock star in the making, but you're a rock star. It's just the way you speak and the way that you tell stories. Please keep going. Cause I think that there's oh, so man. much, so much for you to do in this world. You you are definitely meant for 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 amazing things, for great things. So keep going. You are the epitome of a beast. <laughs> and so keep rebuilding Thank that beast you. and keep growing, okay? Thank you so much. Thank yes. you for sharing that with me. All right. Cut. That was, yeah, that was killer. <laughs> You're awesome. You're awesome. That was that was amazing. I, I didn't even know what to expect. I was reading your story and I was like, wow, like she's actually been through a lot and this is really special. So thank you for being willing to share it with me, but with everybody else who's listening. Well, thank thank you for the the platform. You know, I think that this has been a huge thing and I've been really diving deep into just like speaking my truth and story. And I feel like nothing ever happens for no reason. And we're definitely I'm so big on like any podcast or anything that I do with people. It's like this is a piece that we've created. I mean, it's going to go out on the Internet. Like I'm connected with these people for life. We're connected for life on all of these like stories that we've been telling and lives that we're impacting. So I think that it's just been awesome meeting people like yourself. I know that anyone who has a podcast talking about rebuilding the beast has a a heart and a story that goes deeper Mm. than the average person. And anyone who's achieved pro level in anything has the will and the drive more than the average person as well. So I just love connecting with like minds that, you know, throughout this journey, I mean, we're both young. We we got a lot of life to live, like connecting with people that we can, you know, lean on in in the future times and you know just just kind of understand keep me updated with anything that you have going on if you're ever in california again sacramento the bay area or la please let me know i'm in la now but i'll be in the bay for the basketball season because i work for the team now so yeah i'm also rebuilding my beast as well you know so just just let me know if there's any way i can support you but thank you thank you for this 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 is awesome this is amazing you're an incredible person No, so are you. You have a really good heart. And for sure, let me know. Um, I have, I mean, I have like a a marketing agency out here in Hawaii, but it's just, I know everyone in the news and everyone, all the like celebrities here in Hawaii that, you know, everybody just puts in that extra effort. So if you're ever in Hawaii, I have like a ton of business and businesses and brands that like work with me and my team of people that I kind of just represent sometimes. So if you're ever looking for something super fun to do, hit me up because I know what? everybody. And we're say less. Sensitive. Stay less. <laughs> we are we are coming to Hawaii. I'm bringing my brothers and we're coming to Hawaii. So right, say you guys less. gotta come. Everyone would have so much fun. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We got a plug now. We good. Everybody rebuilding. No. Beast. Yeah. <laughs> if we go no, in no, Hawaii. Literally. I'm <laughs> no joke. I'm literally like a little Hawaii plug, but I'm trying to keep it on the low because everyone's getting too excited out here. Yeah. <laughs> oh man, I can't imagine, especially after the pandemic and people being locked down. I can't imagine. I feel like ever since everybody over there this summer. 
feel like yes, everybody would be over there. Smoke. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's packed. So if if you ever need anything, just let me know. I'm sure we'll probably um have to do some business or something together soon or just you know just for fun talk stories hang out we will, learn we each will cross stories. paths for sure we will cross paths for wait sure. i saw i saw something did you do you do um hosting or yeah uh, i'm a yeah i'm a sports analyst wow so like how is that that's fun that's fun that's just like you i try new experiences see what i like and i just bring my whole self to it and i started doing it last year and it was this they it was great amazing my team won the championship it was just like everything was just incredible so i'm like all right let's keep going let's what see cool what else journey. we can do yeah yeah so yeah. that's my, right now, my own personal rebuild mm, right now i'm looking into kind of doing something like i'm working with espn honolulu right now and i've been in talks with some people for like broadcasting some sports stuff but i it's all so new like you know how you just jumped mm. into it i don't know i don't really know what to expect so it's interesting it's always so the only advice that they gave me was be yourself and part of being yourself is we play the sport you know what the sport is and so when you're talking about it i'm assuming you're going to be doing it for your sport if you're not then it's it's still amazing to hear athletes speak about other sports as well but mm -hmm. we know the lingo. We know how to talk to people. I think that that's the, they just want to hear you. They're hiring you because mm -hmm. they want to hear you. So um, the only advice they gave me was that. And I followed that and it's been, it's been working out pretty well so far. So hopefully, hopefully that's a path that I want to keep going down. If not, then you no, find you something should. else. You, know? you should. I feel like you have the voice and like the, the energy for it. Really? Thank you. It's good. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. That means a lot. I, I actually will say the same about you because you do a good job telling stories and that's really what you need you know nice yeah Shoot, this is awesome you're you're great you're so fun what time is it over there right now uh right now it's 12 10. oh it's 12 so your day is kind of just starting yep midday this is where we're at right oh now. oh my gosh i just got back from cabo a few days ago and man it's like I always it's wonder why run. don't I, I was actually relaxing. It was cause I, yeah, that's a whole thing. I just came back from Burning Man before that. So that oh, was goodness. pretty fun. So I needed relaxing and oh, I went to Cabo and Cabo was, was amazing. Beautiful. You always think it's like, why don't I take more vacations, you know, but in this mm -hmm. journey, but when you also do what you love though, like you just, you feel like you're on vacation all the time. So I'm always feeling like I'm on vacation when I'm doing what I'm doing, you know? So, yeah. um, Oh, hopefully... it seems like you travel a lot. Let's go. No. Okay. I'm planning next year to do like a full launch of my like Pacific athletes program, just so I can get the word out and like start getting some donors and stuff. But I was planning on having a celebrity softball game, like a home run derby, really? one of those, you know? So yeah. hey, we might have to fly you out. <laughs> I got yeah. Plus, I got people who also like that stuff as well, who like to play and whatnot. So, if you need people, let me know. Dope. Yeah, it would be Hawaii's first one, but you know, I'm yeah. always all, all about Hawaii's first at this point. So yeah, that's know. that's you. That's your that's your brand. That's actually really dope. Hawaii's first, huh? I wonder if you could do something with that. But oh, for real. Let Shoot, us. Yeah, okay, I'm gonna let you go though. No, 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 no. Like I'm saying, yeah. Up with ideas. <laughs> <laughs> no, let's wrap. Please stay in touch. Uh, yeah, you got my social media and stuff. So just hit me up whenever if you ever need me. And yeah, I really appreciate you. I will. Uh, I'll send you a video of. Matter of fact, let me take this off. I'll send you a video of uh, this stuff when it when it comes out. I have uh, Victoria send it to you. But meanwhile. I got to get you to make a so, video. Yeah, I'll got you on social media. I'll shoot you over my email and my, my cell. So if you need anything, that's the fastest way to reach me. I'm the type where I'm always in meetings, but if someone calls or texts me, I'll just call back or whenever can. I'm always down for new ideas and whatever's. Okay, boom. I'll find it after. Okay, you ready for a video? Yeah, what's the video? Just you talking about what we talked about just now. What I'm, we just talked about? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, okay, wait, is it going? Yeah, it's going. You ready? All right, well, yes. I want to be ready when I already got the video going. So, yo, <laughs> Kama. <laughs> Kama, you are a model actress, first ever softball professional pitcher from Hawaii. 
D1 scholarship to Cal Berkeley, Fresno State. And man, you're just doing so much amazing things. What was our conversation just about? We just had an amazing conversation on rebuilding the beef about just, you know, pursuing your passions, going against adversity, and just really just shooting for that next level and everything that we do. And man, the, the energy, the good vibes, this is such a good podcast. So just, just exploring all these different aspects that people go through in order to face adversity and get onto that next level, whether it's playing pro ball, whether it's you know, going to college or whatever it may be and rebuilding this beast in different categories of our lives. And man, I just had a great time and I can't wait for you guys to see how this how this podcast turns out. This is a good one. Awesome. Thank you. Hey, Fest is here. I hope you liked that episode. Don't forget to subscribe, like, comment, and here's some more episodes that you might like. Uh, I mean, I'm listening. <laughs>